This is simnews.tv and you're listening to the Super League Show. Wow, we Suzuka took us one step closer to a championship fight that will be very short lived for anybody whose name isn't Rudy Van Buren. Jake Sanson here for the Super League show. It's going to be a very interesting uh, conversation we've got in front of us. Ben Willis is not available, so joining Casper Kolodijic in the uh, studio here this week is the boss of Vodball Motorsport, Mike Pittman. Hello, Casper. Hello, Mike. Hello, everyone. Right. Uh, shall we jump straight in with the news from Singapore that Florian Gaia received a bit of a penalty uh, from Singapore? We didn't talk about that last time because it hadn't been announced when we were last on air. And that meant, Casper, that Alex Siebel uh, got the podium last time out for Adonis, uh, which is not bad for a stand-in. Not at all. And Alex Siebel has been... Uh, we have talked about, uh, about him a good few times now. And he's been... I think it was only his second or third race at that point, And... Yeah, he has shown some great pace, and obviously he is also uh, doing some great stuff in Super Cup. So he's doing a fantastic job this season. Uh, but uh, yeah, post race penalties are uh, obviously always Geyer uh, pen uh, penalized for a move on. No, I can't remember exactly on which driver, but yeah, that's how it happens, and well, you you got to live with it. And uh, yeah, he got three seconds for uh, illegal use of DRS. Oh, three seconds for illegal use of DRS. Sorry. So it's uh, I always find that a little bit funny, actually, with the DRS, since it's kind of a bug in the game. But then again, it, it it's not really the first time we've seen something like that happen either. So you just have to uh, be cautious about it when you're driving the car, basically. Mm. Interesting, isn't it, that the boss of Vodball remembers exactly what the penalty was for for the opposition there. Uh, let's move on, shall we? <laughs> Sorry, I had to get that in there, Mike. I'm not trying to be vindictive. That's, let's that's move on. fair enough. You'll probably be able to say very similar <laughs> next time. <out. laughs> well, there was no Alex Siebel in town for Suzuka. He wasn't available, sadly, for Adonis. However, they did manage to employ Sergei Hedas, Casper, for this round of the championship. A very inspired choice to put alongside Fran Lopez for this one. Yeah, uh, Harris ended up doing some amazing. Ended up doing uh, really quite well, and if I recall correctly, he's coming in from another series as well. Um, and honestly, it it really shows. So I think it's kind of, and we're going to probably talk about that a bit later. But uh, Adonis seems to have this kind of a thing uh, where they're just struggling to keep that second. A seat going with anybody uh, as a standard driver so but to be honest there it seems like every single time they bring somebody in uh, especially ever since Siebel they're bringing somebody who's really really quick and they're they seem to really hit the nail on the head every uh, pretty much every single time and they've been doing really well even for stand-ins every time so may, who knows maybe it's actually also a bit of a Fran Lopez effect where they, he helps them out. I don't know, maybe. He's a good, well, good yardstick, isn't he, Lopez? I suppose. Yeah, he, yeah, absolutely. Fran, that's a good way of describing it, actually, Mike. Yeah, Fran Lopez is pretty much a spot-on yardstick, especially as the season has evolved. He has become a much stronger driver. We came to Suzuka wondering what had happened to Lee Morris. Well, work commitments have kept him out of the seat again. Nick Rowland unavailable as well, so we thought for a moment it would be a bit like Singapore and no Mad Cape would show up. But in fact, they drafted in uh, two super subs of their own, Mike Pittman, in Mikhail Galka, and Xavier de Cavallo, very last minute in de Cavallo's case. Well, yeah, Cavallo, I don't think, um, I think he was obviously struggling to find people to sort of fill the seats, I suppose, uh, where they did miss the round before. Uh, but yeah, having to fill in himself, that's pretty good dedication, really. It was such a late call, he started from the pit lane because he didn't even do qualifying. Um, and yeah, he didn't last that long, to be fair. But actually, on his day, he's not actually that bad a driver. I just don't think he was ready for this event in any shape or form. Uh, but the commitment to the series, he got two cars on the grid. Uh, and actually, Galka actually impressed me. I'm sure we'll get onto it. But, you know, he's been doing things in Formula Challenge. If you've been see, watching that at all, he's done, mm. uh, well, done the last few rounds, at least, anyway. He's, he's not been lighting up the timesheets, but he's consistent. He's finished every race. And actually, at this stage of the season, that you know, Mad Cape, we've been, you guys have been shouting in this series, they need a second car that finishes. They need a second car that finishes. Maybe I found one here. 
Granted, he may not finish Absolutely. that high up necessarily, but that's better than not finishing. Absolutely. And the difficulty for Mad Cape really is that although they brought home a car with points uh, this time, Casper, I mean, missing Singapore and drafting in two complete newbies for Japan, it's really hurt them in terms of the Constructors' Championship. We'll go into it in a bit more detail, but Valters are now third, Adonis are now fourth, and Hawkeye are now fifth. That is literally since Monza. They have slipped from third in the Constructors' Championship down to sixth position. That is how close it is in the battle for third position, and that's what it's cost them. Yeah, it's sad to see. And luckily, again, Lee Morris has been bringing in so many points over this entire season. And it, it was him and his job basically entirely since the beginning of the season and it's good to see uh points being scored again but it was just it's not enough you need to have somebody like morris back in the car and scoring those high points to even have a chance of maybe of even keeping well i think the sixth place is fairly steady at this point but to get get back even in one place they're gonna need morris back and asap uh but Honestly, it's good to see at least one of the drivers finishing the race. Again, uh, Xavier it seems like was just not ready at all. And uh, he did, uh, again, come in last minute. So there's no... It, that's definitely just unlucky, unlucky in that sense. But to see Gaukas finish in points, well, uh, you know, point, that's definitely better than not finishing with both cars. Absolutely. Another point to pick up on the end of the season is that the Street Fighter Racing Systems team, Kurnow Sport and Green Stripes Racing all entered just one car for the Japanese Grand Prix, which is a very interesting uh, sign of the times for the end of the season, but can't be helped, unfortunately. Every single team, though, uh, went the way of Ultra Soft, Super Soft, Soft. And there was not a single team that went out of the uh, uh, line. And I have to talk to you about this, Mike, because uh, you guys over at Vodball, you were the one team that deviated away from the common strategy at Singapore, and it came back to bit you. Was it just about playing it safe at, at Suzuka, making sure you, know, you weren't going to get caught out by anyone else pulling a fast one? Uh, well, you guys uh, covered it pretty well last time out, to be fair. I listened and changed my mind. Uh, but the, <laughs> fair enough, there you go. But, but no, but there's, uh, you know, last time out we tried to play something different. We'd lost uh, quite a lot of time in the car itself, so we thought we'd try and do something different. It was a gamble. Uh, it backfired slightly. Um, you know, it's, it was one of those we were trying to catch up, and we thought, well, this time we'll, we don't need to do that. We can take them head on, uh, you know, pace for pace now. And that's what we tried to do. And obviously, we got to see that in the race. The tyres, Casper, uh, definitely came into play because, once again, we found that the Ultrasofts were definitely not the right tyre to be on. No, it's the Ultrasofts are just way, way, way too soft. And it, it, you can work them for a couple laps, but they, I would presume they just overheat uh, as well and just have such a short lifetime that after a few laps, they're not going to be faster than a, than a, than a super soft and it's just not worth it at all super soft is the race tire this season and even though it doesn't last that long none of the tires do so but it just lasts that bit longer um and keeps the pace a, a lot better than an ultra soft tire so yeah ultra soft literally the uh, the only reason to be on an ultra soft is to start the race and even then we have seen a driver start on a other compound of tire i can't recall quite recall yeah as 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 you sort of get into though it's interesting every team picked the same three compounds but they were all the teams used them so differently like some really favor that ultra soft tire and use mm. it all the time they can but we saw some people actually use the soft tire to a good you know to good use this time out um but arguably yeah most teams stick it safe on the super softs um but it's just interesting that actually different cars and teams are going different approaches you'd think at this stage of the season now that we're all picking the same tyres, we probably have the same strategies, but we really don't. Actually, okay. uh, it was Jarl Tyen, by the way, that, that started Jarl Tyen and started on a soft tyre and kept and actually put it out earlier, and that's what actually got him so high up. That's very true. Okay, so the qualifying session was a straight fight between Vodbol and Nordsjön with uh, a car each on the first two rows of the grid, which was pretty exciting stuff. Fifth position on the starting grid. Well, Alex Cooper, we thought there could be something very special from him uh, alongside Fran Lopez with uh, Sergei Heras going a very impressive seventh ahead of Diego Baldi in eighth, uh, Michael Ayres ninth, and Dino Paolini tenth in the end uh, with Jarl Tyen, actually the real... Uh, 
well, the really short, the short straw from qualifying, only getting out onto the grid in 15th position in the end. Uh, so we had the scene set for some drama, and we certainly got it, Casper, right at the nod. First of all, Rudy versus Florin, and then Rudy, Fidek, and Lopez uh, in the early stages. Things got pretty heated in the early couple of corners. Heated is the right way to say it. And, um, yeah, we had quite a few contacts in the first couple of corners and all basically start with the uh, Rudy and Florian having a bit of a wheel bang and, and uh, Rudy unluckily coming back onto the track uh, hitting Fidoc and Lopez involved in this as well and uh, that's all for disciplinary committee to really see what what happened there I can't really comment too much on it but uh, yeah, I, I don't really like when the two teams that are the biggest competitors in the series end up uh, having so much, uh, so much contact. And we'll talk about it as well in, uh, further since that was not the only contact between the two teams. I kind of want to bring Mike Pittman in at oh, this point because <laughs> I, I, I am the person, you know me, the reason this show is entertaining is because I ask the difficult, awkward question. Uh, no, I don't want to be, you know, too flippant about it, but obviously, you know, it's been a week since the race. There have been discussions about this in and out of the series. What is your current feeling? Do you feel that something could happen that will affect the way things start next time out? I mean, what, what's your current mood about it? Uh, well, come on, mood. Uh, well, it's no, it's. I think it's in the hands of the DC at the moment. We must say nothing's uh, definitely, but everything on the first lap is always reviewed anyway. So, um, but uh, I'm how to put it. I'm I'm expecting some penalties our way. Right. Whether okay. or not whether or not we're the only ones to receive penalties is a different matter, and how much those penalties are. We 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 kind of thought that during the race as well, uh, which as we come onto the results, I can sort of talk you through that a little bit, but. Um, yeah, the uh, it it wasn't. No one likes to see the cars touch. That wasn't the intention in any way, shape, or form. For me, the team, I'm sure of that. Um, but it just proves how. I mean, you can see it from the qualifying how close it was from all four drivers. Mm. Um, so it was always going to be quite close, and we always want. You know, everyone want. It's that stage of the season now where it matters. Um, and yeah, they they're all that kind of driver where they want the dedicated want to win, and they all can they're all that good to do it so um it's inevitable that at some point they're going to find themselves on a similar part of the racetrack um this is actually the first time though uh, it does put, whereas the rest of the season we've had incredible starts and normally jumped people into the first corner uh we actually bogged down here and florian got our, the jump on us um mm. and it's the first time we've seen that and it's caused a bit of problems this is a point i do want to look into a little bit casper in the sense that you know this race probably could have been and should have been a lot closer all the way to the end. I mean, in terms of raw pace, we had several drivers who could have challenged for the victory. We had several drivers who could have challenged for the podium. But because of those little incidents, say, in the first six, seven laps or so, there was a lot of contact, let's be fair. We had Risto and Florian Gaia having contact for the lead in their battle. We had um, Florian Gaia and Sergei Heras, which was a really difficult one as well. And again, you couldn't really say you know, one driver over the other was at fault. But there was a lot of racing incidents over the course of that race, which damaged quite a lot of races. I mean, who knows where Alex Cooper could have finished if he hadn't got into the wars. It was a very sl a scrappy sort of a race, even for this year. Mm, it, it could just be that it's a little bit difficult to overtake in, uh, at Suzuka, so drivers have to be a bit more aggressive with their moves. And especially that the most opportune overtaking spot is turn one. And we had, and especially you could see that in Risto and Geyer. Um, it, there, if one driver accidentally lo just doesn't give enough space, it could end badly for a lot of drivers. And uh, another thing about this track is it's so easy to make a mistake that mm. uh, it, with tires being so hot for the S's, uh, the drivers just, it's, it's a very tough track to get uh, right every single lap. So it's, yeah, I, I'm not actually that surprised that we've seen some contact. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit... Uh, yeah, that definitely it could have looked a lot different. And the fight for the lead, I feel that if not for the contact, could have been between... Uh, definitely could have been between Fidoc and um, and Rudy, if if not for that contact. Although I still have a feeling like, a, like Rudy would have pulled away. He has been very, very fast this weekend. 
Certainly has indeed. One guy to benefit from all of those mishaps, though, Yal Tyen, who really grabbed the bull by the horns and really took his opportunity well. He was able to get himself into a strong position. I and mean, eventually, of course, Flo Geyer and David Fyder managed to get the Nordian cars into fourth and fifth, exacerbating some of the damage for, to Nordian in the Constructors' Championship. But Yal Tyen, an absolutely standout performance. He did a cracking job to get it into third place. Mike, even, there were times, you know, when Yal was even starting to look potentially a bit of a threat to Risto. Uh, well, yeah, he was on a completely different strategy. The, the guy qualified down at about 15th or something like that. It was he did, like, yeah. shockingly bad, really qualifying, but that's they sort of thrown back into this, but just proving how good a driver he actually is. He did, whereas, like, say, Risto, for example, we pitted after, like, six laps on the ultras. Well, uh, Jarl started on the soft tyres and got, like, 12 out of them. So he, was he al- did. already gained a pit stop on us just from, from that. Um, so, yeah, he, I mean, he did the whole race on four stops. Um, he was the only one as well to use three compounds of tyres he used all three so he started on the softs ended on the ultras and had a bit of a fun in the middle on the super softs I mean um, he had a little bit of a lonely race as well really it wasn't that once he sort of got into a position and certain people behind him started clashing and then you know arguably we started pulling away a little bit um, he was sort of on his own because of the strategies even the people he met on track were never really fighting him because they were either Mm. just pitting or they just come out and he was about to pit um, but no don't take that away from him fantastic you know to to be honest I know it doesn't sound great 26 seconds off the lead but actually that's pretty good this year um last race it was like 40 seconds off the third place so yeah yeah i mean it's 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 great from him it's great for walters as well they had a great team effort um but yeah yo on his day can be the beating of anyone imagine if he'd actually started towards the front what he could oh have done. amazing i mean let, let's let's talk about that a little bit actually casper because mike has just raised a very solid point there you know third position y'all time in the valters was 26 seconds behind race win and rudy now you're absolutely right in suggesting, Mike, that, you know, at, at one point in the season, that was 40 to 45 seconds. Well, last to last race. <laughs> last race, in fact. Yeah, up to Singapore, you're absolutely right. So, Casper, I wonder, is the latter part of this season going to be a little bit closer? Now, obviously, that what has happened to Vodbo has happened. It's now ancient history. They've got to come back from it. Is this the chance now for the teams to start to knock on wood a little bit here and start to chip away at their advantage? I think the I think that's quite right. Yeah, I, I think we're gonna see quite a lot of drivers closing in, and we already see. Obviously, we see we've seen Norston uh, close down a lot over the last while, and uh, the two teams being very much even. And I think what's happening is a lot of the drivers are finally becoming more comfortable with the cars, so and kind of maybe understanding them more. And teams are generally just getting a better understanding, and they're kind of starting to catch up to what Vodbol seems to know that no one else does, except for maybe Nordston. So and so, yeah, I, I think we're gonna see them close down, and uh, it could provide some great racing. So um, yeah, I I do think that it's gonna the the end of the season is gonna be very interesting in that sense. Now, there's a couple more topics from the Japanese Grand Prix I want to touch on. And in particular, Mike, this one I want to talk to you about. Your two drivers, Rudy Van Buren versus Risto Kappa, in the race. There was some fantastic couple of laps of really close, no-nonsense racing between the two of them. Now, I know you've had the policy in the past where they can race. You know, If they're in a good position, they're not going to take each other out. They can race. What was the feeling of the two drivers after that? Was it a little bit heated between them because it looked a little bit close even for let them race at times uh no actually they were you know yes we have the policy they can race and we're sort of in a quite nice little stage now where pretend you know dare i say it rudy's almost got his hands on that title now um Mm -hmm. and so they're both now going right we're now working for the team doesn't really matter who does what now um but they can have the fun as well they're both racers you know i mean they both want to win um but they do fight very fair. I don't, arguably, you could say, Norton will tell you differently. Uh, but between themselves, they uh, they do fight very fairly. There was it probably wasn't a hundred percent. I'd say against each other, they probably give each other slightly more space than they might potentially others, just to give themselves a little bit of leeway so that they don't don't come under my wrath. <laughs> uh, but they... <laughs> I wonder what your wrath would actually look like. I can't. Well, if you see them come together. Oh, man, See him come, <laughs> come together later in the year. You might well find thing. out. You're, you're such a mild mannered person. I can't imagine what your wrath would look like. To be perfectly honest, it's probably like a matchbox. You just suddenly go, "Now look, <laughs> just one little match." You know, "Now look, I don't want to use this." That, that's a fantastic concept. It's, if you're yeah. uh, well, you might see it towards India. I hope we don't. <laughs> I really hope we don't. Um, but yeah, they they they're free to do. You know, to race. That's the whole point. We put we give 
interestingly here, actually, it was slightly closer, I think, because of that first corner instant, uh, Risto was in the lead of the two. So he got the best strategy call. So he got the pit call when he wanted. He, normally we do whoever the leading driver is can pit. If you're too close, you can't pit together. So he, you know, Rudy had to go longer. Um, and in doing so, we actually decided to take him a few laps longer um, because he'd sat behind Risto and uh, Florian and such uh, across the first few laps. He had a bit of leeway in his tyres for a few more laps. So he changed strategy after that first couple of laps. Um, whereas we kept Risto on what was, we thought was the primary strategy before mm. the race, which, you know, on paper is the quickest way of doing it. Um, obviously, there's different factors with, stra- you know, with all strategies, they can all go out the window halfway through the race due to some touches or through to somebody else holding you up or goodness knows what's gone on. Um, so it, that's, but we always stick to sort of that with the lead guy normally. Uh, and we still played it exactly as we planned beforehand. And actually, looking at his race time, it works pretty well. So there's one other big moment from the race that I want to draw upon. Casper, I want to talk this one through with you. We thought it was close at Vodbol, at Nordsjön, towards the end of the race. That was quite heated. And rumour has it, I've heard on the grapevine, that that battle between the Nordsjön drivers of Flo Geyer and David Fidek was not actually anywhere near as amiable as the Vodbol racing teams. I have a feeling that there was potentially maybe a little bit of heat between those two and i wonder if there's a little bit of tension running underneath the team because i know that there's a chance maybe one of them isn't playing ball with the other in terms of sharing information or data or whatever it might be but that looks like they could be a little bit spicy there yeah it it definitely looked far more aggressive than it (laughs) it definitely didn't look as uh as clean as the battle we had between vod balls and honestly i don't know um Possibly there's something about the, but uh, about we can't them. we can't deny it. We can't yeah. deny that there might be something there between it. It looked no. a bit aggressive there. No, and the the thing is they've been okay. So here is something that maybe we don't usually think about, but these two drivers have been in the same team for at le- I I don't know if they're any longer, but uh, they're there for two years in the same team. They, they, uh, they've been teammates in different leagues as well for about yeah. four or five years before that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Could it be that it's starting to be a bit like Rosberg Hamilton kind of a deal, where oh, one driver yeah. is a champion and one driver is kind of aspiring to be one, but cannot quite get there yet? So it's I, not a I bad mean, idea. Oh, are you, you're saying it's a stale marriage, eh? <laughs> a little bit. Mm, yes. got, got uh, seven, well, seven years. Maybe. Seven year itch. <laughs> seven year itch. You never know. There could well be. I mean, it, it is possible. Of course, when you take all of the incidents from Suzuka into account. You know, next week we may find out that there could be some differences in the final time because of penalties adding on. It could potentially mean, you know, we could get a change. Could even mean the result stands because of, regardless of penalties, there was actually a sizable gap between each driver. So, it, which was a shame at the end of the race. I, I felt it could have been a little bit tighter, but we had several incidents mm. in the race that kind of spread things out a little bit. But of course, those grid drops that could come into account potentially that's a penalty that we may see for one or two drivers. Casper, that could play a factor when we get to Austin. It could, and again, although to be honest, this season has been, and we have seen this in GPWC, it, it, we do get occasional races where we get a lot of penalties. Uh, mostly it's back with the grids um, due to qualifying. So honestly, even if we do get a lot of uh, penalties, it's not going to be that big of a, uh, you know, it's not going to be that big of a difference to just a normal day. <laughs> well, but uh, well, yeah. I- I, I, I disagree on that. I'd say, like, because you don't often get potentially the t- all the top guys here have been involved in incidents in one form or another yeah, in that way. That's very true. It's rare that's you lose true. all the top four drivers potentially down the grid a bit. Is, mm. um, I can't remember fully now, but there was one uh, one track where we had a lot of the top guys, uh, yeah, if I recall correctly. We, 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 we took two back of the grid penalties when we bought a new engine at Spa. Mm. Uh, so that's both, true. Both of our balls went to the well, back there. There's a very good possibility, you know, looking at the way things have currently stood and come out, there's a, a very slim chance we may get to uh, the Circuit of the Americas next week and Yarl Tyon might have won the Japanese Grand Prix. There's a very possible <laughs> chance that that could happen. We'll have to look into that a little bit more uh, closely towards the end of things. So, uh, obviously, most of the teams on the grid at the Circuit of the Americas are going to need to take uh, engine penalties now before the end of the season because of the way that the engine development has actually run. 
So there's a chance we could see, you know, one or two more of the big names uh, ending up towards the back of the grid. So we'll have to keep a lookout on it. So uh, let's uh, give you through uh, a little bit of a rundown as to the uh, final say and the final state of play. Rudy Van Buren, for the moment, is the race winner in Japan, ahead of, for the moment, Risto Capit, ahead of, for the moment, Yal Time. We have no idea whether that's going to change. Flo Guy, David Fleidick, and the fastest lap of the race man, Gergo Baldi. He had to bring it out right at the end there, didn't he? He just loves doing this, Gergo Baldi. I'll get something. I'll get the fastest lap, which he did. Alex Cooper fought back to seventh in front of Sergei Heras. Commendable debut from him. Uh, David Francic and Dino Paolini rounding out the top ten ahead of Michael Ayers, Liam Duval, and then Michel Galka ahead of Gerrit Defries, who does score points in the green stripes great to see the green stripes trinity car making good progress sandy choda well he spent rather a long time on the sidelines perhaps a little bit longer than he would have liked to have done when the car actually died we think that might have been due to a steering wheel failure but uh yeah he ended up for about five laps off to the sidelines with yellow flags down towards the shell hairpin uh, fran lopez binning it unfortunately while battling for a strong position frustrating for fran lopez obviously you know, the world's fastest gamer has improved him, but there is still that capacity to push a little bit too far over the limit in Formula, uh, into uh, Super League anyway. Uh, ben Schubanek and Javier de Cavallo failing to finish as well. And that means, of course, that Rudy Van Buren only needs one more podium finish for the remainder of this season to wrap up the championship. So take his pick. When's he going to do that? Is he going to be Austin? Is it going to be... Uh, well, it could well be next time out. He hasn't finished a race when he's finished any lower than second. Uh, I, he, I think... He actually needs I, less I, than that. He only actually needs 10th. Oh, 10th position 10th now, position, and regardless of what fight... Because it was a podium if Fardik had come second. So if uh, if uh, Fardik wins every race from now on, Rudy needs one tenth place between now and the end of the season. Okay, and, so here's and he'd what And he win it on race wins anyway. Here's what I propose. I would like Rudy to do the entire race as normal at the Circuit of the Americas until he gets to the last lap. And then what I'd quite like him to do is uh, drive the last blindfolded. Would that be all right with everybody? Is that okay? I, 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 I just want to see what would happen, basically. <laughs> just to see, you know, can we make it spin on for another race? I mean, I mean obviously, we're talking absolute lunacy. Well, I am, certainly. Uh, because, you know, it, it's almost a given now. He basically just needs to finish next time out and it's pretty much done and dusted uh best and worst uh mike obviously we know what your best is going to be being <laughs> biased if you take your vodball racing hat off when am i ever moment, biased though, honestly come on and, uh, if you take your vodball motorsport helmet off for just a moment uh who was your standout performer of the race I, uh, it's kind of hard to tell because you, you can't to be honest I'd, I'd give a bit of credit to nausean guys depending on how much uh, how much damage they were driving with you know it's very mm. hard to tell from watching you know they could have had an absolute dog driving that round to get to True. some good points still but y'all at the end of the day is, that's an incredible drive to go up you yeah know, 12 places yeah. granted there's other people's mistakes and bits and but he just had a clean race he drove a good pace he was actually you know fastest lap buys he was up there with uh you know ahead of capit and gaia and stuff so he deserves the place he was sort of in um and and ultimately, it's, it wasn't the best race prep for him. Um, I think he did very well. And little shout out to Galka as well. I think he did a great job yeah. for Mad Cape. He, considering that Mad Cape didn't know that their two drivers weren't going to race until the Wednesday, to actually obviously have found him, got him in the car, and got him to the finish, getting points within twenty four yeah. hours uh, for a Formula Challenge guy, just shows the level that is down in Super Cup and Formula Challenge. Yeah, fair point, and very well said, actually. Casper, uh, any thoughts from your side? I mean, you can hardly look past 12 places uh, gained from the grid of Yarl yeah. Tyen. I mean, everyone else that has had a decent race has also had some kind of a question mark above them, really. Mm. So, honestly, I think Yarl Tyen is kind of a clear winner in terms of uh, the best driver of the day. Mm. I have to say I agree, Yaltine, you can't really look past him. 15th to 3rd and only 26 seconds back on Rudy Van Buren. Uh, I'm sorry, that speaks for itself. Brilliant job, Yal. You win our driver of the day. Well done. And uh, worst performer of the day, Casper, what is your thoughts on this one? I can hazard uh, a guess. I can hazard a guess. Uh, well, we've had a driver that was doing quite decent and well to be honest though Pence Zupanek is not exactly doing very well for himself is he I didn't think of him but yes yes fair point yeah Zupanek did not exactly cover himself with glory in that race I mean it's hard to be the only one and Bart DeVos is a good person to bounce ideas off would have missed having him there 
but you're absolutely right. That was almost unforgivable. Uh, yeah, and especially that he was the only driver for Kernow this race. Uh, yeah. In this race, so basically he just kind of. Uh, basically, the team has been really, really struggling uh, for this race. <laughs> absolutely, uh, Mike. Any thoughts from your side? Oh. Uh, nearly everyone had reason to have done poorly, don't they? It's like it's a bit difficult. Um, mm. I, to be honest, the, the guys that you know, when we'll get onto teams in a minute, but. You know, considering where we've had people before, I kind of it's going to sound really harsh. Maybe it's just my expectations. I expected Paulini to do better than he did. Um, he's in a good car. Yeah. He's a brilliant driver in Super Cup, and I thought he'd come in and do. And he's done some great races in, in uh, Super League. And I don't know. Maybe I just had too high expectations for him. Potentially, I suppose. Um, that was a slight disappointment. But yeah, I mean, Zubinek didn't exactly cover himself in glory this time. It's an easy pick because he didn't finish. Um, <laughs> You know, the other guy. There's a few others that didn't finish as well. Um, you know, uh, but particularly certain drivers who didn't even start. It's pretty difficult, really, to to cover someone who. It's pretty bad, really, when we're worrying who's the worst one, isn't it? Um, yeah. So it, many choices. My, from, from my side, I would have to say probably Fran Lopez, just because that's the kind of mistake we saw from him at the start of the season. Didn't really expect that kind of error at this point in the year when he's obviously developed that much. I mean, I know Suzuka doesn't leave you a lot of margin for error, but he will be kicking himself about that one for quite a while. That could easily have been a fight for the podium for Fran Lopez, and I think he knew that as well. So, uh, teams-wise, a good one and a bad one. Mike, I'm guessing Von Bull is your good one. Well, yeah, I mean, if you come 1-2, yeah, you can't but... really look anywhere else, can you? Even if I am biased, that's still... Come on. Um, ah, okay, fair enough. Well, but, let's <laughs> let's go for a negative team then. Yeah, uh, but but, but, but on that as well, Walters did very well to to get home and mix it up yeah. and be third and sixth. You know, they 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 were obviously trying to get third in the standings and to effectively be the only other team anywhere near to uh, Bubble and Norgen. They they cemented themselves into that third slot really. Unless Morris comes back, I can see them having that now. Uh, mm -hmm. Bearing in mind, Morris is actually sixth in the team standing as on his own, uh, so that's pretty good. Pretty game. much, yeah. yeah. Um, but no, uh, uh, the worst team. Oh, wow. Um, just, well, to me, it has to be one of those that didn't turn up with two drivers. Uh, you know, we we had a, we had a yeah. massive go at Mad Cape last time, but credit to them, they had two drivers that turned up on the grid. Granted, late, but they were there. Uh, Storm have consistently had one now for a few rounds. That's not great by them. Mm, um, yeah. And. Uh, to be honest, green stripes. It, it, that's that's horrendous. If you're not getting the pace, and you're not getting the results. Oh, don't bully the green stripes. <laughs> I'm sorry, no. but if, you, if you're the if you're the Minardi of the team, which unfortunately they are at the moment, then you have to turn up with two drivers because otherwise, what are you providing? You've got if you're but not. They are scoring points. Let's be fair. They are scoring points now, which they weren't. At they one could point. have scored twice if they had two drivers here. But they didn't call me. They didn't call. I could have <laughs> gone in the car. I could have. Knock on the I, door. I, Just no, go and knock on. Yeah, absolutely. No, forget it. Uh, no, that would be evil. Fate worse than death. I wouldn't even make turn one. Casper, uh, uh, from your point of view, best, team, best and worst in terms of team. Uh, best team, to be honest, Valders, I think. Not oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come no, on. No, you're not getting that open. <laughs> no, they weren't, they, actually. Yeah, they, they, were, they kept clean. Both drivers uh, finished uh, above where they started. Uh, Tyen obviously doing great. Uh, Baldy doing a good job, keeping his head down, uh, finishing sixth. So honestly, I I, I think Valdez deserves the best uh, best team for me at least. And to be honest, because for Vodpol, we're always expecting them to be up there, and we have seen them uh, get double uh, a a win, uh, you know, a lockout on the front multiple times this season. That's true. I'm going to say Valter's for Team of the Week as well. Just because you said it, Mike, Casper, you said it, and I can't think of another team that deserves it. They got, you know, two cars fairly close to the mark can, of can uh, I, Nordsian and Can I say, for, one, for a 1 2, that's only our second one of the whole year. You may have assumed we've done more. Of course you can say that. Of course you can say that. Of course you can say that. That's absolutely fine to say that. So, what was your worst team, Casper? Come on, what was your worst team? Well, I mean. To be fair, turn out, turn out, and turn again. I, I it's an easy one, I guess. But turn out, turn uh, turned up with one driver, and that driver didn't finish. No points scored. Yeah. I mean, it's tough, but I I'd say that they mm. have been disappointed in that sense. Yeah, uh, I, I don't have to agree. I I can't think of anybody else that that really ha well. 
you could say that Norsen has disappointed, but then again, it wasn't exactly their. You could argue that it wasn't exactly their fault that they suddenly fell down, but we yeah. would argue. <laughs> <laughs> I think they currently I'm sure are. Should, I'm sure, yeah, we're currently having that argument where in a board somewhere on the way to Austin as we speak. But uh, yeah, I have to say, Kernel, you need to be turning up. When other teams are not turning up with one car on the grid, you need to be one of those teams that's got two cars on the grid. Uh, by the way, Green Stripes Racing, uh, you know where to find me. You know where my email address is, my number is on my website. Come and find me, you know, I'll, I'll come and drive for you. I'll finish last, but hey, these days, that'll get you a point. So uh, let's, do, let's, uh, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. So uh, let's move on to uh, the next series. Uh, the next uh, round of the championship, of course, is going to be Circuit of the Americas. Uh, next Tuesday for Formula Challenge. Next Wednesday for the uh, Super Cup. And next Thursday for the Super League. On Tuesday night, you'll be looked after by the capable commentary team of, in some variation, Dan Blake, Josh Jones, and Elise Skinner. On the Wednesday, of course, it's going to be Ben Willis and yourself, Kasper Kolodicic, on the uh, Super Cup. I'm sure you'll look after us. And then, of course, it'll be myself and Josh Anderson on the Thursday night for more Super League action. And I can't wait. The Circuit of the Americas, it'll be an interesting one. Anybody who's down on power, get ready to sweat. It'll be an interesting one. We've, of course, uh, got some more shows for you on the uh, same day uh, next week. We've got the Scrutineer. Uh, building up ready for the Super League, of course. And then, of course, we've got uh, all of that simnews.tv coverage to look forward to. We'll be back on the 12th of October. Uh, do please uh, keep on up to date with Downforce UK on Twitter. That's the team that presents the commentators in one way, shape or form. Two of the championships, at least. And, of course, listen to us here and uh, follow us on Twitter at SLShowSN and with the hashtag SLShow. Do subscribe below as well if you're listening uh, via YouTube or Facebook. My big thanks once again to Kasper Kolodijic and Vod Bormo Sport Team Chief Mike Pittman. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. And as Rudy Van Buren breathes a sigh of relief for Suzuka with a victory in his pocket, for the moment at least, all he has to do to cross the finish line as the champion is be in the top 10. It's up to the rest of the teams to put cars on the grid and battle for it. But for Nordsjön, they may have their own inter-team squabble to sort out first before they can even think about Rudy and Risto. It'll be an interesting one. I'm Jay Sanson. See you in two weeks for the Super League show. And see you in a week at the Circuit of the Americas.